So we talked a little bit about what perfect contrition is, and the other question that we've been receiving quite a bit is, what is spiritual communion? And especially as we're beginning into Holy Thursday and Good Friday and Holy Saturday, this is really a strong question that leads us into the Easter season. And I think the very first thing that we have to realize is, who is the Eucharist? Not what is the Eucharist, but who is the Eucharist? And what we need to do is go back to um, St. John's Gospel. Because in St. John's Gospel, in chapter 6, we hear this beautiful Bread of Life discourse uh, coming to us in powerful ways. It happens right after they received the loaves and the fishes, the 5,000. And Jesus says, you're coming to me because you're hungry, not because you want spiritual nourishment. And very similar to the woman at the well, I have something more that I can give you. And they look at him and say, well, what can you give us? And very similar to the woman at the well, he does something very unexpected. He talks to them about him being the bread of life. And in being the bread of life, that whoever comes to me shall never hunger or thirst. Very similar, again, to the woman at the well that we heard earlier on in Lent. So as he's unfolding this bread of life discourse, he is talking about himself and he's utilizing that first person pronoun, I am the bread of life. But he's also talking about the bread that came down from heaven. Later on in the gospel, he will talk to us about that which has come down from heaven will lead us to heaven, especially when we hear it within the gospel of St. John during the time when the Last Supper is present there. So he talks to us again and reminds us that he is calling us into this deeper relationship with God through him being this bread that came down from heaven. And later on in the chapter, he starts to talk to us around the 50s, 53 to 59, that unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you shall not have life within you. Those are strong statements. So where does that leave us with the Eucharist? Well, the Eucharist is the living bread of Jesus. Jesus, we know, is raised from the dead. And being raised from the dead, he is living. So we are not eating dead flesh as we were accused in the first century. You know, one of the problems was, was in the first century, there was a lot of misunderstanding about who the Eucharist is. So they thought we ate Jesus. We literally ate his body. And we had to correct that and say, no, we are eating the body of Christ as the bread of life, not as cannibals who are eating dead flesh, but as living bread that he has given us in the Eucharist. And within that Eucharistic sustenance, within that gift of the Holy Eucharist, Jesus becomes present to us. He becomes present to us in powerful ways, in most perfect ways. Many times we think of the Eucharist, you know, and as we think of that Eucharistic gift of God's love, that how can Jesus become bread? How can he become wine? More importantly, how could bread and wine become him? And it's an incarnational question. In the Old Testament, the question is, how can God become human? And that's even brought up in the Bread of Life discourse. Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Don't we know his family? Don't we know where he's from? So even they question the very incarnation of Jesus. Is this God? So, needless to say, people question, is the Eucharist truly the body and blood of Christ? They questioned it back then as well. It went so strongly as after the Bread of Life discourse, when he was done telling them about this beautiful gift that he's willing to give them, they said, this, this is too much for us. And they went back to their old ways. It's rather interesting. This is John chapter 6, verse 66. So, you know, the mark of the beast is known as 666. So it kind of goes along those same for formats. But in that verse, they leave him. And in leaving him, he turns to his disciples and he says to them, do you also want to leave? Peter's confession then comes forward. And it's worth noting, this is uh, verses 30, 67 to 69. He says, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. That should sound familiar, shouldn't it? In the raising of Lazarus, what are the words of Martha who believes that Jesus can do anything? Lord, I've come to believe and I'm convinced that you are the Son of God. I trust you can do this. And then he goes off and raises Lazarus from the dead. 
And then Jesus gives us the bread of life. So the Eucharist, as we know, is this gift of love. But it's more than that. When we celebrate the Holy Eucharist, when we truly celebrate Jesus' presence to us in his body, blood, soul, and divinity, he unites all of us together in what we call communion. So communion is found in the oneness of who we are, and we're found united as a Catholic Church, one holy Catholic and apostolic. That one piece comes through our unity of worship, the fact that we worship that's around the table of our Lord as Jesus, the bread of life that has been given to us. We worship as one church, the body of Christ. So our unity is found in the fact that we are united together in our baptism. So in our baptism, we are called as sons and daughters of God to live that faith and that we are called within that lived faith, the oneness of charity, as we go forth and proclaim the good news. So the news that we proclaim, the doctrine that we proclaim, what we believe is then shared with the world. So we are united because of Jesus, but we are also united as a community. So when we are apart from that community, when we are apart from Jesus, whatever separated us from him or from the church, when we are apart from him, we long for him. And we long for that unity. We long for that presence of Jesus that was talked about in St. John's Gospel at the Last Supper when he says, I pray that we that they may be one, as I am in the Father and the Father is in me, that we are one. So that unity of community is what Jesus is praying for and asking for in very powerful ways. So when we are separate from that community or when we are separated from God for whatever reason, then what happens is, is there's a longing that takes place within our hearts. And when we achieve that unity again, that true unity, it is then that we are filled with a joy and a peace that this world cannot give. Now, where does that come from? It's not only theology, but it's rooted in Scripture. Think about St. Luke's Gospel on the road to Emmaus. On that road to Emmaus, we meet two disciples. So two individuals who are walking away from the church, who are walking away from the body of Christ. And why are they walking away from it? They're walking away from it because of the pain that they're feeling on the inside. When Jesus approaches them on that way to Emmaus, he approaches them and talks to them about where they're at, what's going on in their lives. And one of the disciples speaks up and says to Jesus, don't you know everything that's happened? Don't you know what we've been through? What sort of things that have been occurring? And Jesus asks them, what sort of things? And then they go on to tell them how their hope and how they're, they're longing for Jesus to be this great leader, or this great Messiah, or this great Savior came crashing around them because it wasn't what they expected. And how he was crucified and how he was buried. And yet, how people have come to them and said, well, today he's risen from the dead. And that's too much for us. We can't hold on to that. And in that struggle, Jesus meets them and says to them, how slow of heart you are to understand all that the scriptures have said. And he journeys with them through the scriptures and he walks with them until they get to that point when it is evening. And when it is evening, they are enamored by him. They love what they're hearing. And they realize that there's something that's incomplete here. There's something more here. So stay with us. It is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So they're longing for his abiding presence. How does he show that to them? He takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them. The scriptures tell us immediately their eyes were opened and he vanished from their sight. And then all of a sudden, they say, were not our hearts burning within us as he walked along the way and explained the scriptures to us? And then what did they do? They didn't sit around. They didn't just hang out. They immediately went back to community. They immediately went and joined up with the apostles who told them and reiterated to them the good news and they then told them what they experienced along the way. But notice what they say. They say to each other, 
They were not our hearts burning within us while he was spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us. So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them, saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way, but how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread, how he was made known to them in the Holy Eucharist. And in that moment, while they were still speaking about this, he stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. You see, it was great that they were explaining Scripture. It was great that they were talking about Scripture. It was great that they were understanding his presence in the midst of them. But that was only a burning. That was only this thing that was growing in them until finally they were able to receive him. That's spiritual communion. Spiritual communion is this longing for Jesus' presence in our lives, in the Holy Eucharist. And until that is fulfilled, there's always going to be something missing. There's always something that we're going to be longing for. Because the life that he promises us, the abundance that he gives us in the Holy Eucharist, is not yet fulfilled. So we are walking along this way, and our hearts are burning within us. He's explaining scripture to us. We are recognizing him in powerful ways, found within the works of the church, found within these moments of prayer. But until that moment when we receive him, when we are able to truly receive him in the blessed sacrament, our hearts are still going to be burning. When will that happen? When we can come back together in community. When we come together as a family of as a family, as the body of Christ, when we come together to celebrate the Blessed Sacrament and the Holy Eucharist and the Holy Mass. Until we can come together as a community, my heart still burns, along with everyone else's. Spiritual communion is a realization of what we long for, a unity that is not quite there yet. And so once this virus leaves and everything uplifts, we come before the Lord, recognizing this longing, this burning within our hearts to celebrate the Holy Eucharist and the Holy Mass with a renewed vigor and a greater hope. So my brothers and sisters, can you please pray with me a spiritual communion? My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most blessed sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you are already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you or your church. Amen. God bless you, and thank you.